Good morning. Really glad you're here today. We're actually launching a, a two-week series called The Neighborhood Today, and our staff wanted me to uh, wear a sweater which I zipped up and then put on sneakers which I tied while I sang the song, Won't You Be My Neighbor. I don't know how many staff it would require to convince me of that, but we don't have that many staff yet, so <laughs> that's not happening today. I, um, yeah, it looks like this morning is a, a day for, for tech issues, I think. You probably noticed on your way in that uh, construction is moving along. The, the concrete has is, is mostly been poured out there, and framing has started going up, and, and uh, the steel has been ordered. And, I just want to remind us, I don't want us to forget this, our goal is to create more space for you to invite your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers to experience God's grace for themselves. That's the purpose behind this. And we want to be part of our community. Our goal is not to separate ourselves from those in our community, but to be a good neighbor. And in fact, that's why we want to talk a little bit about this topic today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. And it's probably the most famous passage in Scripture about who a neighbor is and what a neighbor does. And in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law, uh, this is not civil law per se, it's, it's more religious law, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to, what's the next two words? Justify himself. That, that's a really important thing to know. So he asked Jesus, so who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, it was the coin, basically a day's wage, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Jesus saw things differently than anyone else, and so he said things differently than anyone else, and lots of people like that, but not everybody. And uh, if you were a person raised in very uh, religious tradition, that would have been a challenge for you, and so there's a legal expert, his, his expertise is in religious law, and he decides he wants to test Jesus. Here's the thing about testing. When you're testing someone, you're not trying to learn something from them, you're trying to teach something to them. So he's going to educate Jesus in this moment, and he asks a question, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds with a question. Don't you hate when people do that to you? You ask a question, and then they ask a question back. All you wanted was an answer. And the, the legal expert responds to Jesus' question, how do you interpret the law? And he says, love God with every part of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that is a really good answer. That's the correct answer. Do that and you will live. But that answer, which was his own answer, made him uncomfortable. Because that happens. And so he needs a little more clarification. Evidently, 
There were some people in his life he didn't want to be responsible to love as much as he loved himself. And so he asked the question, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds with a story. And I know there's lots of people who say they love this story. Quite honestly, every character in this story makes me uncomfortable. Every one of them. Three of them expose my vulnerabilities, and one of them exposes my inadequacies. And so it's just a hard story to, to listen to or to read through. The first character is the man who winds up becoming a victim. He was targeted, and he was attacked by robbers. There's a particular part of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It, it's, a, it's a very uh, steep decline overall, but there's parts of that geography that... You don't have a clear line of sight. People can hide quite easily. And that is a place where robbers would, would hide out. And, and so they, they jump this man and they, they take from him his clothes. And there's times when I wonder how, how am I putting myself in an unwise or unsafe situation. It's what we think of when we see bad things on TV, right? We see how somebody went to a concert or they went to an event and something bad happened. And, and the thought that eventually works its way into our mind is that that could be me. That could have happened to me. And we just get very uncomfortable with that. And, and then there's the robbers. The robbers are people who will work together to bring injury to someone for the purpose of taking something from them. This isn't an accident. They, they didn't just trip over the guy or something like that. We wish people like this didn't live in our world, but they do. And the reminder of that makes us uncomfortable. There are people who intend harm. And I, I can't tell you, it, it just it troubles me. It makes me so uncomfortable that not only is a person capable of internally thinking about harming someone else to take something from them, they're willing to initiate a conversation and draw someone into their conspiracy so that they can together even do more harm and take more stuff. I, I wish we could just say if, if people had better options or better resources, they wouldn't do this, but that's not true in our world. There are people who intend harm. And when we see it on TV, it makes us really anxious. And then there are some religious leaders in the story. One is a priest, one is a Levite. Just for the record, all priests are Levites in, 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 in Judaism. But the priests kind of have more responsibilities and higher standards. So like they're, they're held in higher regard. They're responsible for more stuff, and the rules are stricter for them. And then a Levite comes along, and the rules are less. And Jesus is kind of saying, you know, does, it, does anybody have a right to say, well, the rules are low enough, I, I can engage. And so they go by, this is what Jesus, he puts in a really interesting phrase. He said that the man was half dead. That means he's half dead and he's half alive. This means that right now, this guy's future is uncertain. It could go either way. That he's right in that position where he can't do something to get himself out of this, but maybe someone else could. Someone has to make a decision. Will I create distance or will I make a difference? And they both decided to change lanes rather than to change a life. They just walk on the other side. I, I think that religion wrongly practiced will lead us to see others as less. This is one of the most astonishing things to me, that there are people in, supposedly in the pursuit of God that actually see other people as less. In fact, religion has this unbelievable capacity to see injustice and call it justice as though a person deserved what happened to them, that this is some kind of a divine judgment that's being poured out. Who knows what they did to deserve that? And, and it's a problem. And if we see somebody as less, that's our license. That's our ticket. We can walk away now. As soon as you are worth less, I can walk. That's how our world works. Uh, when my daughter was in... Uh, middle school, she decided that she wanted to own a bird. Now, I grew up in a house where we owned birds, and I knew how much work went into bird ownership, and I wasn't a fan of the whole concept. So, of course, we do what all parents do. Well, if you can work and you can save 
and you buy the bird and you take care of the bird, you can have a bird. And my, do- my daughter was one of those diligent people who worked and saved and bought the bird. And, and I remember going to the pet store for her to select the bird that she wanted, and, and her heart was attracted to one particular bird. It was a big cage with lots of birds in it, and there's this one little bird that seemed to be picked on by all the other birds. They, they, would, they would bite at it, and they would, they would fly at it, and it, it just kind of well, cowered in the corner of the cage, and, and her heart was drawn to that little bird, and, and so she said, that's the bird I want. And so they got the bird, we brought it home. That's when my daughter discovered that, um, you've heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. <laughs> it's true about birds, too. <laughs> this, this thing was like a carnivore. It was a, a flesh-eating little bird, and, and if you stuck your hand in your cage, you could, I mean, it would take chunks out of you. It was a nasty, nasty little bird, and, and uh, none, none of us cared for it all that much, but, it, but my, my daughter loved it, <laughs> and, and it, got, it got sick, and so now we had to take it to the vet. <laughs> See, that's, I don't have to say anything more. Do you have any idea how many birds you can buy for one visit to the vet? I could have done a whole replacement bird thing, but my daughter would have known because the next one would have been nicer. <laughs> and so we go to the vet, and, and, and every day for quite a while, I would have to go into the cage and get the bird and pull it out and, and get an eyedropper and open its beak and put some medication in it day after day after day after day. And I can, I can remember asking myself, why am I doing this? You know, I am not of the persuasion that all creatures of our God and King need to be given medication. I'm, I'm not, I know I'm, I'm on the outside liars on that, but, and I'll tell you why I did it. I actually didn't like the bird very much, but I love my daughter. And she liked the bird a lot. Every single person that we lay eyes on, we might not like very much, but their Heavenly Father loves them with an unending love. We have to remember that. Uh, The other thing that religion and wrong practice can do is that we see ourselves as less. I don't know what it is. Just under some religious concepts, we start thinking that we are so bad we can't do anything good or make any difference. And so we stop trying. We're even afraid if I do try, I'll make it worse. And there's a reason why we're afraid of that, because there are things we have tried that we made worse. Like, that's all part of our story. We just are afraid that if I try, it won't make a difference. I don't have the skills. I don't have the resources. I don't have the temperament. I don't have the time. It's going to be a colossal waste. And so we just, we create distance. We change lanes. But the gospel tells us that we've all been created in God's image and likeness. And the gospel tells us that he is near to each of us. And he is ridiculously generous with all of us. And if we ever lay claim to those truths, we're a lot less likely to change lanes and a lot more likely to do the things that help change lives. See, our value is not determined by what we have done for God, but by what God has done for us. We haven't done something that increased our value to him. He has shown us our value to him by the giving of the ultimate price, his son, on our behalf. And then there's one final character in the story, and it's the Samaritan. And what you have to appreciate in Jews and Samaritans had no dealings with each other. They hated each other. It was the kind of rivalry that exceeds anything we've ever experienced in our culture. In fact, at the end of the story, Jesus asks, who was the person that was, that, that was a neighbor in this? And the expert in the law will not say the Samaritan. He won't say that. He'll say the one that showed kindness. That's how much animosity there was. But this guy decides that he's going to slow down, move towards, he's going to risk something, he's going to pay something for someone that's very different from him. He didn't know this guy. 
And here's a big thing for us. This is where the whole crux of this story kind of hits home with us. Our neighbor is someone who is near us, not just someone who is like us. We look for people that are like us. If this is your first time today, I guarantee you did something. When you walked in, you scanned the room to see if there was anybody kind of like you. Maybe about the same age, maybe about the same education status, maybe about the same marriage or non-marriage status, maybe about the same life experience. Like if you are a, a, a young family with little kids, you'll kind of look to see if, if those people are in the room. And, and the reason we do that is because we, we get uncomfortable with people who are not like us. We don't know what to say to them. Like, what, what will I talk about? And, or worse, we're afraid that they will say something we don't like or don't agree with. So please hear this next thing. It's critically important. It's critically important. We cannot grow or develop in our spiritual life if everyone around us looks like us. It cannot happen. We're stuck. If everyone in our life looks like us, we're stuck. And it's not going to get better. We just, we have this, we feel uncomfortable, and that discomfort starts creating some distance, and we start changing lanes. And, and the thing about discomfort is it evolves. It evolves to a thing called fear. Discomfort will move you to the other side of the road, but fear will eventually keep you from going down some roads or any roads. It'll paralyze you in ways you can't possibly calculate. Before long, you're stuck. And when we see other people and they're different, we can, we can have some preconceived ideas about them. Uh, so I'm going to throw some scenarios out there, and I don't want you to respond. Don't shout out an answer, okay? Just think it, okay? So what kind of preconceived notion might you have for, for this? Just finish the sentence in your head. Poor people are... Hmm. Rich people are... Obese people are... Old people are... Young people are. Women are. Men are. Or in all our culture, it often goes like this. All men are. <laughs> Pastors are. Oh, I know whatever you thought of right then was wonderful, but... You should know that that's not true everywhere I go. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but I don't like to tell people what I do for a living because as soon as they find out what that is, they have a set of assumptions that's very hard for me to get past. They create distance. Buffalo Bills fans are... <laughs> See? See? We make an assessment before we ever ask a question or we ever have a conversation. We pre... Judge. That's what prejudice is. It's just a judgment before we have any information. And every time we prejudge, every time we're preoccupied, every time we're anxious, every time we're distracted, the tendency is change lanes. I'm still headed to the same place. I'm just going to create a little bit of distance. All of those things can make us change lanes. So I have a question for you. Who do you tend to avoid in your life? Who is it that you would change lanes just to not lock eyes or engage in conversation? Like, I know what the culture is right now, and, and like, there are lots of people that if someone has a different political view, they're going to avoid them. In fact, right now the statistics are you are far more likely to marry outside of your faith than you are your political party. Who you think is God is not nearly as important as who you think should be president. 
And so that just creates all kinds of lane-changing consequences. Or educational issues, they're too smart, or they can't keep up, or economic issues, they've got more, or they have less, or fashion issues, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing something like that. Just religious issues. And, and this isn't like just different faiths. That's complicated enough. But within the Christian faith, we have people who will change lanes to avoid conversations because you can be conservative or liberal in your theology. You can be Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. I mean, just all the options. And you'd think that would inspire conversations, but it doesn't. Occupational issues. It's just astonishing. Last Sunday, I wasn't here. Everybody did a fantastic job, by the way. In fact, I heard the services were better without me. No, no, no. Don't, I'm not saying that to feel bad. I, um, I don't know why I said it. <laughs> Guess I need to see a counselor. I don't know. So, but we were with our granddaughter for a couple of days. Um, what a delight. 15 months old. Very limited vocabulary. And yet she can communicate all of her desires. It's uh, we went to a number of places that were just public and lots of other kids around. And I watched her and I observed something. It was really intriguing. Every time she came in contact with another toddler or a child, the first thing she did every time was smile. She did. And so I wondered if I do that. I don't think so. Smiling takes no time at all. It's what comes after it that might take a little time. We're going to change lives or change lanes? Please hear this. We are not creating more space to create more distance. We're not trying to make it easier to avoid people. We want to be a neighbor. So the Samaritan, he goes to the wounded guy. He closes the distance. He slows down. He sees more than wounds and bruises. He saw the person who was between life and death, and he made an assumption. Maybe something I do right now can make a difference. I think that's what God is to us. He's our neighbor. He comes to us. He sees more than our brokenness. He knew without him we wouldn't survive. He knows what he does will make a difference. He doesn't just pour out oil and wine. He pours out his own blood. He takes a path that easily would have been avoided, and he refuses to change lanes. He draws near, and he pays the price so that we can live. It's what he does. Maybe it's what he's calling us to do. And maybe if we don't change lanes so often, we'll wind up in some more divine appointments. Maybe there's a real difference that could be made if we're willing to do something a little bit different. So, he, so well, I don't know what to do. All right. Lesson from a 15-month-old. Let's just start with a smile. In fact, we're going to practice it right now. <laughs> Put on your best smile. Look at the person next to you and then ask them, how is it? Just go ahead. Just do that. Yeah. <laughs> Something as simple as just asking what someone's name is. I, I wish I had one of those minds that remembered everyone's name. I know some people like that. I don't have that mind. I usually just remember the first letter of their name, and then I'm a reckless guesser. <laughs> or sometimes just finding something to be appreciative about, it, it makes a big difference. You know, I know my reputation is I, I'm not the most patient person in, in the world. I, I don't act badly. That doesn't make me patient. Yesterday, I was, I was coming home from seeing my parents, and I walked into a truck stop, and Turns out it's a holiday weekend. <laughs> Everybody's got some place to go. And the particular fast food that I prefer had a line of I don't know how many people 
it was going to take too long to count, much less to stand in. And I just told myself, I'm not that hungry. <laughs> I did. I went and got my car. So easy to do. But there are times when I have been that hungry. And I'll stay. And sometimes... You'll see a person behind the counter, it's understaffed, they weren't prepared, they're doing the best they can, they're frustrated, everyone else is frustrated, and lots of people are saying so. And so I'll just, I'll get up to the, to the counter, and I'll just say, hi. And they'll look at me like I'm a crazy person. <laughs> I'll try to smile. Then I'll tell them, looks really tough here today. I've been watching you work. You work hard. I really appreciate that. I don't know if everybody else does right now, but thank you. All I can tell you is it feels like life flows into someone in that moment. And it took so little of my time. It cost me so very little. but it just means that I don't change lanes. I'm just willing to do that. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're resuming life groups. We kind of take a break in the summer. We go back up in the fall. Some of you are already engaged in those, and, and, and it is life to you. Like, there's a reason we call them that. There's other people, you might be a little apprehensive or uncomfortable because, you know, is there anybody there that's going to be like you? I don't know, but you could try it and see. Maybe there will be someone there who you can provide something to in terms of your life experience, or they can provide something to you that really helps. Maybe you'll learn to actually see God and, and yourself and others just that little bit differently. You can, you can be a neighbor. You can trust that they have value and that you have value, and God wants to use that opportunity makes a lot of difference. I think we want to be kind people. I think we want to be courageous people, but I think we all struggle with the great temptation just to change the lane. It's so easy to do. We don't even have to signal. We just have to lean. We're going to change lanes, change lives. Let's bow our heads this morning. I really do think that God provides a lot of opportunities for this kind of thing. I think there are some divine appointments built into our, our day. The question is not, does it happen? The question is, do I notice it? And some days are better than others, right? But I'm wondering if you're willing to ask God to call to your attention those moments when you're feeling just a little bit uncomfortable and you're leaning. Just that little bit of distance can... You will feel better if you're on the other side of the road. And maybe that's not why you're on the road. Father, um, help us. Open our eyes to see more than bruises and wounds. Help us see ourselves, not as, as the solution to someone's problem, but as having something to offer in that moment that can make a difference. Help us see them differently. Help us see ourselves differently. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.